moments. We're going to wait this meeting until is everybody recording. comes into the room. So just uh, give us a few minutes and we'll get started. Right, so hello to everybody that's out here. Just give us a few moments. We're just going to wait until everybody gets into the room. Uh, so sit tight. We'll start in about a minute or so. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started here. Hello to everybody out there tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Derek. I'm one of the reference librarians. A uh, quick little few announcements before we get started. We have a couple programs you may be interested in. On Wednesday, August 31st at 7 p.m., we're going to have former Deputy Administrator of NASA, Lori Graver, and she's going to be talking about Escaping Gravity, My Quest to Transform NASA, her newest book. A couple days after that, Tuesday, September 6th at 6 p.m., we're going to have Steve Bruchette, and he's going to be talking about the rise and reign of mammals, a new history, his newest book. So we'd like to thank the Learned Owl for providing copies of this newest book here, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, Rebels at Sea. So if you're interested in purchasing a copy, in our little chat window, there'll be a link so you can buy it from the Learned Owl. And by the way, you can ask questions, and we'll have time for questions at the very end of our program. So there's a little Q&A thing at the bottom. So go ahead. Don't be shy, ask some questions for our author. So let's introduce our author. So tonight we have with us Eric J. Dolan, and he's the author of 15 books, including Leviathan, The History of Whaling in America, which was chosen as one of the best nonfiction books of 2007 by the Los Angeles Times and the Boston Globe. His most recent book before Rebels at Sea was A Furious Sky, The 500-Year History of America's Hurricanes, which was a finalist for the Kirkus Prize it was chosen as one of the best books of the year by the Washington Post, Booklist, and Library Journal. He's a graduate of Brown, Yale, and MIT, where he received his PhD in environmental policy. And he lives in Marblehead, Massachusetts with his family. So I'll turn it over to the author. Thank you, Derek. Uh, thanks everybody for showing up and thanks to the Hudson Library for inviting me to give this talk. I really appreciate it. Years ago when Gwen first reached out to me to come speak at Hudson, I was actually going to fly out there and be in person, but then COVID hit and uh, now we're doing it again via Zoom and hopefully someday in the future if I'm invited back, I can make it out to Hudson to see what your city is like. But uh, with that, I'm talking to you from Marblehead, Massachusetts. I know there's a Marblehead, Ohio that has a beautiful lighthouse. I wrote a book called Brilliant Beacons about lighthouses a number of years ago, and I remember running across a Marblehead, Ohio. But uh, maybe one of these days I will make it out to Hudson. But with that, I will start. Let me make sure my clicker is on the right one. Okay, it was late in the day on June 3rd, 1780, when Captain Jonathan Harriton and his privateer Pickering were heading towards the friendly port of Bilbao, Spain. The British privateer Achilles, however, stood in the way. Nobody would have faulted Harridan if he had fled in the face of a superior foe. While the Pickering had a crew of 38 men and 16 cannons, the Achilles had a crew of 132 men and 43 cannons. Hardly a fair fight, but that's not how Harridan saw it. He relished the chance to confront the enemy and strike a blow for the American cause. Turning to the British prisoner who had informed him of the Achilles' might, Harridan said, I shan't run from her. And he didn't. As the Achilles began its approach, Harridan told his men that though the Achilles appeared to be superior to them in force, he had no doubt that they should beat her off if they were firm and steady and did not throw away their fire. Meanwhile, in Bilbao, word quickly spread that two vessels just offshore were about ready to engage in a battle royale. So about a thousand people from Bilbao rushed to the beach to watch the spectacle. Booming broadsides and musket fire filled the air. One of Harridan's crew said that while shot flew around him, Harridan was as calm and steady as if amidst a shower of snowflakes. The battle raged for more than two hours, 
and then Harridan ordered his men to put bar shot into the cannons. Bar shot is basically two cannonballs connected by an iron bar. And when that exits a cannon, it starts spinning wildly and it can shred sails and rigging and even destroy a mast or a spar if it hits it head on. Whoops. Having had enough, the Achilles turned tail and fled with the rebel commander close behind. But despite its injuries, the Achilles was too fast and it got away. So Harridan spun around. He recaptured the Golden Eagle, which was a British ship he had taken earlier, but that the Achilles had taken back. And uh, all told, one of Pickering's crew had been killed, his head sheared off by a cannonball, and another eight men were wounded. The number of British that were killed or maimed is unknown. And before going to the next slide, I want to tell you a little story about this plaque. This picture is the top third of a much larger plaque that I read about while researching the book. It was a plaque that was produced in 1909 by the Sons of the American Revolution. And they placed it in Salem on the side of a house where Harridan had once lived. And in addition to lauding his efforts as uh, the captain of the Pickering and his battle with the Achilles, it also listed some of his other accomplishments as a privateer during the American Revolution. So when I read about this being in Salem, and I lived in Marblehead, which is right next door, I got really excited. I hopped on my bike. I went to the intersection where it said this plaque was supposed to be. I looked around for about a half hour. I found a couple of other historic plaques, but I didn't find this one. So I went back home. I called the local Salem historian and I asked her what she knew about the plaque. She said, well, you're gonna find this a little bit humorous. Uh, the plaque is actually down the street in a Korean barbecue restaurant. So I hopped back on my bike. I went back over to Salem and this was at the height of COVID. So I walked into the restaurant and the woman there was very excited because there was not a single person in the restaurant. And she thought I was there to order food. But I said, no, I'm not here to order food. I'm here to actually look and take a picture of that plaque that is uh, right behind your head. And there it was right behind where the hostess greets you as you walk in to the Korean barbecue restaurant. So I think that's sort of emblematic about of how America has treated its privateering history, sort of shunted it aside. Now, Harridan remained in Bilbao for two months. And uh, he was treated like a king there after his successful battle against the Achilles. On his return voyage, the Pickering captured three more British prizes, which were set, sent into Salem. And when Pickering returned to Salem, the owners of the Pickering uh, gave Harridan, their intrepid captain, a present, which was this silver tankard inscribed with the image of the Pickering and his initials and two companion silver goblets to honor him for his efforts. During his tenure in the Massachusetts Navy and as a privateer, Harridan took many prizes and brought hundreds of cannons and as many British prisoners into the colonies. He died of tuberculosis at the age of 59 in 1803. His obituary in the Salem Gazette lauded him as one of the most able and valiant naval commanders that the war had produced. The Pickering was one of nearly 2,000 American privateers during the American Revolution, and Harridan was one of perhaps as many as 30,000 privateersmen who served on those privateers. And privateers were armed vessels owned and outfitted by private individuals that were given government permission to attack enemy ships during times of war. That permission came in the form of a letter of mark, a formal legal document that gave the bearer the right to seize vessels, vessels of belligerent nations, bring them back into port, have the vessels adjudicated in a trial, and if it was determined that they were a valid prize, the vessel and its cargo would be sold, and 50% of the proceeds would go to the owners of the privateer and any investors, and the other 50% would go to the men who fought on board the privateer. Whoops, sorry. Now, despite the contributions made by Harridan and thousands of other privateersmen, many believe that privateering was a sideshow in the war. Privateering has long been given short shrift in general histories of the American Revolution 
and more criminally, I think, in maritime histories of the war. Rebels at Sea fills the void by offering a comprehensive account of privateering that demonstrates that it was critical to winning the war. American privateersmen took the maritime fight to the British and made them bleed in countless daring actions against British merchant ships and not a few warships. Whoops, sorry, I just have to push this thing. Whoops, why is that not working? Anyway, sorry, the uh, something happened to the screen. Wait a second. Uh, and not a few uh, warships. Privateers caused British maritime insurance rights to rise precipitately, diverted critical British resources to protecting their vessels and to attacking American privateers and contributed to British weariness over the war. And one of the most important things that privateers did is they also helped France decide to join on the American side in the revolution. On the domestic front, privateering brought much needed goods and military supplies into the new nation, provided cash infusions for the war effort, boosted coastal economies through the building, outfitting and manning of privateers, and bolstered America's confidence that it might succeed in its seemingly quixotic attempt to beat what was surely and was the most powerful nation in the world. Thousands of books have approached the revolution from virtually every angle. Rebels at Sea places privateersmen at the very center of the war effort. It demonstrates that when the United States was only a tenuous idea, they stepped forward and risked their lives to help make it a reality. In fighting against the British on the ocean, the Americans relied on four maritime forces. There were state navies, Washington's secret navy, which operated for about a year near the beginning of the conflict, the Continental Navy, and privateers. Of these four, privateers are by far the most numerous and the most effective, capturing somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,600 to 1,800 British ships worth many millions of pounds. Massachusetts was the first colony to authorize privateering in November of 1775. The importance of the Massachusetts Privateering Act in unleashing privateering in the colonies became even clearer in hindsight. Some 40 years later, John Adams would write that the passage of the Massachusetts Act is one of the most important documents in history. The Declaration of Independence is a trifle in comparison with it. New Hampshire and Rhode Island followed suit in early 1776 with their own privateering statutes. At the same time, pressure was growing for the Continental Congress to authorize privateers, and they did so on March 23, 1776 passing the privateering resolution into law. With their capital tied up at the docks, ship owners eagerly pursued privateering. Prizes that were brought in not only provided ships that they could sell, but also the cargo on those prizes could be sold to earn money. Many men invested in privateers. Indeed, privateering spurred a speculative frenzy across the colonies, sort of like the frenzy in Bitcoin as of late. Among the more illustrious spectator, speculators was General George Washington, who invested in at least one privateer, appropriately enough called the General Washington. Generals Nathaniel Green and Henry Knox, as well as Paul Revere, also invested in privateering best ventures. Now, privateer captains would usually be hired directly and offered the largest number of shares of any prize taken. Now take a good look at this picture, Elias Davis Sr. He was a privateer out of Gloucester, Massachusetts, which is about 20 miles north of where I'm sitting right now. Keep in mind that while I was working on this book, it was during COVID. My wife was working from home, my daughter, who's a literary agent, was back from New York working from home, and my son was back from college. So uh, I decided when I saw this picture, to invite my daughter, Lily, into the room to take a look. She was single at the time, still is. And uh, I said to her, Lily, take a look at this guy. This guy's a privateersman. He was a captain of a privateer. And she took a good long look at him and she said, you know, dad, I could get into privateering because <laughs> he was so good looking. Now, while crewmen were sometimes known by the owners prior to being hired, in most cases, they were not and they had to be lured on board the privateer. 
it wasn't really difficult to sell them on the idea because of the prospect of earning money. But what would be done is in papers up and down the coast, whenever a privateer was ready to launch, they would the owners would place an ad in the newspaper like this one that would invite people to what was called the hearty welcome at the local pub where they'd be plied with plenty of liquor and then they would sign the articles of agreement for joining the privateer. Now, black men served on many privateers. Some were freemen. One of the most well-known, not at the time, but later, was James Fortin, shown here later in life. He was a free black man in Philadelphia. At age 14, he signed on to the Pennsylvania privateer, the Royal Lewis. Fortin's job was to bring gunpowder from the ship's magazine to the cannons. The cruise was a triumph, with the Royal Lewis capturing seven British prizes and bringing them back into Philadelphia and selling them for a handsome profit, some of which went into Fortin's pocket and he shared with his parents. Fortin was so excited by this turn of events that he decided to sign on again to the next cruise of the Royal Lewis. In hindsight, he shouldn't have been so uh, rash because barely a day out of port, the Royal Lewis was captured by the British ship, the HMS Amphion, whose captain was John Baisley. Now, uh, the, whoops, oh, whoops, sorry. What happened is uh, Fortin was quite nervous about this because he had read, and it was indeed true, that most men of his complexion, in other words, black men who were captured by British ships during the American Revolution, were sent to the slave marts in the Sugar Islands in the Caribbean. And Fortin thought that that was going to be his fate. But fortunately for him, Captain Baisley had a 12-year-old son on the ship, and his son needed a companion, and he tapped Fortin to be that companion. And for four to five weeks, Fortin did an excellent job and got off quite well, got on quite well with Captain Baisley's son. So when the HMS Amphion pulled into New York City, where the men on board the Royal Lewis were going to be deposited in the Jersey prison ship, Captain Baisley gave James Fortin a choice. He said, you can either go to England as my son's ward, get a good education, be free, and have plenty of money. Or you can go with the other men on the Royal Lewis and be imprisoned on the Jersey prison ship. James Fortin was a true patriot. He decided to go with his fellow privateers. And he spent eight months on the Jersey prison ship before being traded in a prisoner exchange. Other black men were enslaved persons who signed on after running away from their owners. Many owners also rented out their enslaved persons to make money. Now this painting has a fascinating story behind it. It was owned by a urologist in Rhode Island and it was thought to be the only known painting of a black privateersman during the American Revolution, an American. And as such, it was in great demand. It was used in a number of books about the American Revolution and the role of Black individuals in fighting that war. And in early 2000, Francis Tavern, which is in New York City, was going to launch an exhibit that looked at the role of Black individuals in the American Revolution. And they wanted to use this painting as the centerpiece of their exhibition. So the owner of the painting, the urologist, sent it out to an art conservator to have it spruced up a bit. The conservator took a mild solvent and started wiping away the grime on one of the hands and off came the black paint, revealing a white hand underneath. It turns out that somebody in the mid 20th century realized that a unique painting of a black privateersman would be much more valuable than a painting of a white American mariner during the revolution, painted it, to appear as if he was black. And he was right. When this was thought to be a black privateersman, the value of it was estimated to be $300,000. When it was determined to be a fake, it plummeted to $3,000. But the urologist still kept the painting and had it hanging proudly in his living room until he died. And now it's owned by a friend of mine who also lives in Rhode Island. Now, then there were those black men who were treated as transient property. When privateers captured British slavers, their human cargo was viewed as just another commodity and sold at slave marts in the Caribbean and in the colonies, in effect, transforming privateers into slave traders. 
Now, many have argued that privateersmen were motivated by greed, more by greed than patriotism. Famed naval officer John Paul Jones, shown here, believed it was nothing but greed. A less cynical assessment viewed privateersmen as being motivated by a combination of profits and patriotism. And this view is closer to the truth. Part of the reason privateering was scorned was that many believed that the practice undermined the Republican ideals of the revolution, which called for the sacrifice of private interests in the pursuit of liberty. According to Mercy Otis Warren, author of one of the earliest histories of the revolution, privateering had a tendency to contract the mind and led it to shrink into selfish views and indulgencies, totally inconsistent with genuine republicanism. Many of the founding fathers and mothers and other elites would have agreed in theory. But in practice, however, many elites had a more complex view of patriotism, one that wasn't based on hewing to Republican ideals above all else. The majority of the delegates to Congress clearly believed that privateering was a patriotic endeavor that served the public good. They made it a centerpiece of the war effort, fully aware that it was making some individuals, including themselves, rich. Had Congress deemed that privateering worked against the public good or that it wasn't a net benefit to the war effort, it could have ended the practice, but it never entertained that thought. That's because it didn't view the pursuit of, didn't view patriotism and the pursuit of profit as being mutually exclusive. The argument that privateers were in it only for the money implies or actually argues that others engaged in the fight weren't, but that was not true. While the men who rose up after the Battle of Bunker Hill were burning with patriotic fervor, that fire was difficult to maintain for many soldiers by the later years of the war. The only way that Congress could keep some semblance of a strong fighting force was to use cash bonuses and the promise of land to induce men to serve. The Navy was no different. The Mariners who joined Washington's Navy as well as state navies and the Continental Navy were all motivated in part by money. Each of the naval services offered the men a cut of the profits in the prizes that they captured on top of their base salary. This uh, broadside, which was uh, put together by John Paul Jones in 1777 and plastered all around Portsmouth, New Hampshire, could have just as easily been a advertisement for a privateersman. In it, it said that it would give men an opportunity to distinguish themselves in the glorious cause of the revolution and also to make their fortune. The perspective of most privateersmen is best reflected in the comments of privateersmen and colonial and soldier Christopher Prince, who said, looking back on his revolutionary career, through the whole course of the war, I have had two motives in view. One was the freedom of my country and the other was the luxuries of life. Now privateers experienced many triumphs and tragedies during the war. One of the most successful privateers was the Pennsylvania brig Hulker. Over four years with 11 captains, it, per, it, ca it brought in more than 70 British prizes. In one of its most triumphant outings, the Hulker captured 10 prizes, which realized nearly 2 million pounds at auction. One of the worst tragedies to befall privateers occurred during the Penobscot expedition the largest American maritime force assembled during the revolution. It consisted of 19 warships, 12 of which were privateers. Their mission was to dislodge British forces that were building a fort on a peninsula in Maine's Penobscot Bay, on pre where present day Castine is located. The expedition sailed from Boston on July 19, 1779. Poor organization and leadership and a critical delay in launching the attack led to a fiasco. When on August 14th, the Royal Navy arrived at the mount, mouth of Penobscot Bay, including a 64 gun ship of the line. It was a complete rout. In the end, 16 American ships were burned by their own men to keep them from falling into the hands of the enemy. And the rest were captured or sunk. And to make the burning of those ships even more uh, dramatic, the ship's cannons had all been primed for firing. So as the ships burned, the cannons exploded, sending shrapnel into the air. As for the men, they bolted into the woods and tried to find their way 
back to Massachusetts and New Hampshire before starving. Many men have, many have labeled it the most devastating naval defeat that the United States suffered up until the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1741. Now, one of the most important things that privateers did during the revolution was to bring France into the war on the American side. In the early years of the war, France allowed American privateers in the Caribbean and in France to use their ports to reprovision and sell prizes and even bring on new crewmen, many of whom were French. All of this was in violation of treaties France had with Britain, and that plus the damage done by the privateers infuriated the British. The Continental Congress sent William Bingham to the French colony of Martinique, and one of his main goals was to encourage American privateering. And it worked brilliantly. In 1778, it was estimated that privateers, American privateers, had captured more than 250 British merchant ships in and around Martinique in the Caribbean, and that trade to the area, British trade to the, their sugar islands, had plummeted by 66%. So alarming were these figures that the Earl of Suffolk urged Parliament to keep them from the public, pointing out the impropriety of acknowledging what ought not to be acknowledged at so critical a period, the weakness of the nation. Meanwhile, Benjamin Franklin, who was in France to negotiate a formal alliance, was convinced that privateering was helping the American cause with the French, while at the same time injuring Britain. That which makes the greatest impression in our favor here, Franklin wrote, is the prodigious success of our armed ships and privateers. London's public advertiser asserted that if France continued to allow American privateers to sail from French ports, an immediate war between France and this country will be the inevitable consequence. The critical turning point in getting France to ally with the Americans was the American victory over the British General, G General John Burgoyne's army at Saratoga on October 17, 1777. Privateering, while not causing a sharp turn in American fortunes on its own, helped create the situation in which this great American victory could prove decisive in bringing France into the conflict. It did so by greatly increasing the enmity between France and Britain, and also inflicting serious damage on the British economy. Now, arguably, one of the most horrific chapters, or the most horrific chapter in the American Revolution concerned British prisons in England and in New York. In both places, American privateersmen made up the bulk of the prison population. The two main prisons in Britain were called Mill and Fortin Prison, and between the two, they held about 3,000 men during the American Revolution, most of whom were privateersmen. The death rate at these prisons was between three and 6%, which is pretty average for the time for a prison. Mill and Fortin prisons were bad enough, but by far the worst experience was any combatant had to endure was to stay on one of the British prison ships moored off New York City between 15,000 and 22,000 men were held on these ships. All of the ships were dreadful, but the Jersey was by far the worst. Nicknamed Hell Afloat, the Jersey had been a fourth-rate 64-gun ship, British warship, the largest of the, Brit of the prison ships. The Jersey held at any one time between 850 and 1,200 prisoners. Between six and 12 men died every day. Each morning, the British guards would yell down to the prisoners, most of whom were privateersmen, rebels, bring up your dead. One inmate left the following damning portrait of his time on the Jersey. There were about 1,100 prisoners on board. There were no berths or seats to lie down on, not a bench to sit on. Many were almost without clothes. The dysentery, fever, frenzy, and despair prevailed among them and filled the place with filth, disgust, and horror. The scantiness of the allowance, the bad quality of the provisions, the brutality of the guards, and the sick pining for comforts they could not obtain, all together furnish continually one of the greatest scenes of human distress and misery ever beheld. The number of deaths on the Jersey alone is shocking. The best estimates point to it being roughly 11,500. 
the vast majority of which were American privateersmen. By comparison, in the entire war, somewhere between 4,400 and 6,800 Americans died in the direct line of fire. One of the biggest criticisms of privateers is they drained men away from the Continental Navy and Army, which is true. This is, it's absolutely true. Many men chose to become privateers rather than going to the Navy, in part because they were lured by the chance of earning more money. But that doesn't mean that had there been no privateers that the Continental Navy would have been transformed into a fiercer fighting machine. There are only 60 Continental Navy ships during the American Revolution. Building and assembling a Navy from scratch would have been a gargantuan task for a well-functioning, well-funded government. The American colonies, or by this time, the states, as they called themselves, was anything but. Trying to get the 13 states to row in one direction was extremely difficult, sort of like herding cats, and the Continental Congress could not levy taxes, so it couldn't raise money to fund this Continental Navy, which took up 16% of all the money that was available to it. So the Navy came together in fits and starts. Now the Continental Navy's record in battle is not an enviable one. 28 vessels were captured or destroyed, and many others were lost at sea, sold or burnt, returned to France or burned to keep them from falling into enemy hands. At war's end, just a few Navy ships were left. There were, however, some bright spots for the American Navy. Raids on Caribbean munitions depots brought back valuable ammunition. Continental Navy ships did an excellent job of ferrying diplomats and correspondents back and forth across the Atlantic. And they captured roughly 200 British prizes. Nevertheless, in July 1780, John Adams, who was a big proponent of both the Continental Navy and American privateersmen uh, sort of reflected on the fortunes of the Continental Navy. And he wrote, in looking over the long list of vessels belonging to the United States taken and destroyed and recollecting the whole history of the rise and progress of our Navy, it is very difficult to avoid tears. The American Revolution was the Navy's first hour, but it was not its finest. If there had been no privateers, the Navy would have had an easier time recruiting officers and men, and it would have had more ammunition and cannons to draw upon. But the absence of privateers would not have meant a much larger or significantly more powerful Navy. Congress would have not have somehow had more money to put into this effort. While many would have preferred that Americans send forth a powerful Navy, that was not a realistic option and privateers stepped into the breach. That was the best strategy available. On the home front, privateers contributed materially to the American economy. Privateering was a great economic boom for coastal towns and cities, keeping many businesses afloat during the war and creating new ones and new fortunes. And the money that privateersmen earned helped them provide for their families and thereby gave an additional jolt to local economies. Each prize auction delivered a new stream of commodities into the economy. In, in August of 1779, a thankful Pennsylvanian told Congress that privateers have rendered us the most essential services and brought us many articles for public and private use, without which the war could hardly have been supported. Privateering also had, psycho had a psychological effect on the home front. About 30 newspapers across the states chronicled the revolution printing thousands of articles on privateers. While some of the newspaper coverage was negative, most of it was positive. That coverage gave people confidence that the larger war might still be won, which was particularly important during those long stretches when almost all the news about the Continental Army and Navy was discouraging, if not disastrous. The formal end of the war came on September 3rd, 1783, when the Treaty of Paris was signed. Surviving privateers were transformed into merchant ships, and they played their part in transporting America's wares to distant ports, proudly flying the nation's new flag. The men who owned and financed privateers, as well as those who had chosen to fight on their decks, looked back on their accomplishments with pride and wondered, as did all Americans, 
what the future would bring for themselves and for their country. And with that, I'm done. So let me stop share and I should be back. Okay, thank you uh, for listening. I appreciate it. As I was saying to Derek, even though I've given a lot of Zoom talks, I still can't get used to them. I don't know, they just are so different from in person. But anyway, I'd be happy to answer any questions and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that the book is available in bookstores. So go get a copy. I've heard a lot of great comments from people who have ancestors who were privateersmen. So that was a lot of fun. And I understand, isn't one of your local bookstores involved or they have, so go to your local right. bookstores, support independent uh, bookstores. <laughs> right. Okay, with that, we'll start with the questions here. So we have a question that asks about, um, were there any American pirates who would attack the American privateers merchant ships as well as the British ships? No, during the American Revolution, there were really no pirates on the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, in my earlier book, Black Flags, Blue Waters, which is about the epic history of America's most notorious pirates, there were a lot of privateers who were actually uh, pirates in deed. They had letters of mark, but they acted like privates, the pirates. During the American Revolution, all the privateersmen, they did not, they were not enemies of any man of mankind, of any ship. They did not attack any ship. They had rules of conduct. They attacked British ships, so they weren't pirates. Although they had the same skill set as pirates. It's sort of like Liam Neeson in the Taken series. He had a, a peculiar skill set. So privateers were very much like pirates in the sense that they were good at capturing other vessels, but they were not pirates during the American Revolution, nor were there any instances that I know of of pirating during the American Revolution. And even more importantly, what happened in many past wars is when privateer when privateering ended, when the war ended, all the letters of mark would be rescinded. So the privateers would be privateers no longer. Now in past wars, like the War of the Spanish Succession during the early 1700s, a lot of unemployed privateersmen who were English at the time, and many of them were in the American colonies, they decided, hey, I've got this great skill set. I'm unemployed. I'm in the Caribbean. Let's go and become a pirate. So that's what they, in fact, did. But during the American Revolution, I have no evidence of any American privateer vessel or American privateersmen who decided upon relinquishing their privateering title to go off and pillage people on the open ocean as a pirate. Okay, uh, where did the term privateer come from? Where did it first enter our lexicon and who were the first to really use privateering or let a remark or a thing? Yeah, well, privateering actually started in the 13th century in, in England. And part of the, they're not really sure where it came from, the word privateer. It probably had to do with back in the 13th century and the 14th century, kings could issue or rulers could issue letters of mark. They didn't, they didn't call them letters of mark back then but they could issue these pieces of paper. They gave you permission, even during times when there was no war, for a private vessel who had been wronged by another vessel, essentially a private vessel who had been captured by a pirate or had their goods taken on the open ocean, the, letter, the, the privateering license of that time would give you the right to basically go back and attack that ship and get back your goods. So it sort of was a private right of retaliation almost. But the exact uh, way that it, I, I don't know exactly why it was called privateering. And historians have been wondering about that. But I think that's probably closest to the reason why. And privateering started back in the 1200s. And it was used by every European power during the 1300s, 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, and even into the 1800s. And the epilogue of my book has a fascinating story, which I won't go into right now unless I'm asked about it. Uh, about what happened to privateering after the American Revolution. It, it pretty much, just to give you the punchline, it pretty much faded away. But in our Constitution, in, in, in uh, Section 1, Article 8, Congress can still issue letters of mark. So we technically could still have American privateers. And there have been people in recent years in certain circles who have been arguing that we need to bring privateering back. I am not one of those people. I did not talk about it in my book at any great length, but there was even a bill introduced in Congress about a year ago to resuscitate privateering to attack Somali pirates. And some people were even suggesting that we should use privateers 
to attack Chinese merchant vessels, which I think is totally beyond the pale because we have a great Navy. I don't think we need privateers to be doing our military work. <laughs> what other privateer uh, fleets the Europeans have during the American Revolution? The French, the British, how effective yep. were theirs compared to, to ours? Well, they're actually Britain who viewed our privateers as pirates. Uh, they didn't hang any of them, they just threw them in jail. But British actually are the ones that taught us how to be good privateers because during the Seven Years' War, a lot of American colonists hopped on ships, became privateers. So we had the British to thank for our tutelage. During the American Revolution, the depredations of American privateers got so bad that Britain went back into the privateering business. And Britain issued something like 6,000 letters of mark, but only about 2,000 of them were to target American ships. And they did a pretty good job. They captured about 600 American ships. The other British privateers were sent out to target French shipping and Spanish shipping. Because those of you who know your history of the American Revolution know that Spain and France both came to the side of the Americans and therefore Britain declared war on their age old enemies, the Bourbons. So there were a lot of privateers on the Atlantic, not just American privateers during the revolution. There were even a few Dutch. So you mentioned the American privateers in your book, where did they go to get cannons and things like that from? Did the Americans give them things? Was the stuff they got from other ships? Was it all recycled from Britain? All three. Um, there were a number of cannons in the colonies because a lot of merchant ships for the war and fishing ships, believe it or not, fishing vessels would go to the sea with one or two cannons, perhaps, or a swivel gun. So there were a lot of cannons in the colonies. There were a couple of foundries in the colonies that made cannons for Britain, and they turned to making them for the American cause. But the number one way that the Americans got uh, cannons throughout the war course of the war was by capturing ships, British ships, that had a lot of cannons on board. As I said, it was very common for merchant vessels, especially larger merchant vessels, to have a couple of cannons, sometimes up to 10 or 20 cannons, six pound, eight pound, 10 pound cannons. So when you capture a privateer and it has 10 cannons on board, all of a sudden those cannons are yours and they can be recycled. So that's that's essentially where all the cannons came from. So the, you talked about a lot of the privateers selling their prizes. Uh, how did how fast was that process? Did they just sell it in a weekend? Did it take months? You know, because I'm sure the privateers wanted to get their money as quickly as possible. Uh, it depended. Sometimes it could take just a, a week or two, uh, or even days if it was a clean cut case. But there were cases that were appealed, and they had to be appealed to Congress. Not, we didn't have a Supreme Court at the time, and those could drag on for months and sometimes years, and in fact did. And there were instances in which the privateers captured uh, non-eligible vessels. They were only allowed to capture British vessels or neutral vessels of other nations carrying British munitions and goods to, uh-oh, uh <laughs> we're seeing. Um, anyway, British munitions and goods uh, to the continent, to the British Navy or the British Army. Uh, but there were cases in which American privateers captured, believe it or not, of other American ships by accident, but they quickly found out and usually let them go. But they had they did capture some neutral shipping that had goods on board that the privateers thought were meant for British forces, but in fact weren't. And there were a number of captured prizes that were repatriated or turned back over to their rightful owners. What's the most surprising thing that you found out during your research of privateers? <laughs> uh, well, every book I've written, except for one, which was about sewage treatment, was on topics that I didn't know a lot about. Now you might say, in a sewage treatment, why do I know a lot about that? Did you use the bathroom? No, I actually, my PhD at MIT was on uh, clean up of Boston Harbor, which is basically 400 years of sewage history. All my other books were on topics that I didn't know a lot about. I'm not a trained historian, even though I'm an historian. My undergraduate masters and PhD are all in biology and environmental policy. So I didn't have this deep well of history to draw on. So every topic I picked for two reasons was 
based on something that I didn't know a lot about. One is because, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have a huge perspective on history or I, now I do after writing all these books, but, uh, you know, so I didn't, I didn't have a well to draw on. But the second reason, which is more important and more relevant today is that I, I get bored very easily. And if I pick a topic I don't know a lot about, then that means I'm going to get excited and learn a lot about stuff every couple of weeks. I'm going to have a surprise. And hopefully some of that surprise and excitement will translate to the written page. So uh, that's, that, that's why I pick topics that I don't know a lot about. And now, and now, see, that's the problem when you answer a question tangentially. What was the initial question? Let me get back to it. I think it was what what surprised you the most or oh, what surprised reason? me okay what surprised me is that I get caught off track on a tangent because as I just told you I get bored easily I also you know talk in different angles but uh the thing that surprised me the most is it is pretty much everything I mean the Penobscot affair is amazing this huge maritime offensive I knew nothing about that I mean literally every single page of this book had something on it that I knew nothing about before I started the book but the biggest surprise was that privateering had a major impact on the American Revolution. I'd read a bunch of books about the American Revolution. I'd written about the American Revolution in many instances in my earlier books, but privateering never came up as a topic to pursue. Uh, another exciting development was that there are a number of privateers from my hometown of Marblehead. So I got to write a little bit about Marblehead. Um, I don't know, the, the other exciting thing was I finished the book really fast because of COVID. I was shocked one day, I, normally, it takes me about 18 months to 22 months to research and write one of these books. But because of COVID, I was home all the time. And I wrote a lot more. So I finished this book in about 14, 15 months. And I remember being totally shocked one day, I think it was in February, I just I, I, I wrote the final word of the epilogue. And I, and I hadn't been thinking about it. And I suddenly said, I finished the book. I couldn't believe it, because the book wasn't due for many months. And so anyway, so the book came out a lot earlier. The book was scheduled to come out in April of 2023, but I finished it so early, it came out in May of 2022. <laughs> so I'm working on a new book now, which isn't going, it's going pretty fast. Actually, this book's going to be very fast because it's on a very narrow topic. And uh, I sort of have all the research materials. So now I've got to start writing it actually this week. So that's kind of exciting. <laughs> So speaking of Marblehead, somebody asked about uh, that. Was that the birthplace of the American Navy? <laughs> you don't want to open that can of worms. Uh, a lot of places claim to be the birthplace of the American Navy. Uh, Marblehead claims it because the first ship that uh, Washington tapped to be part of his private Navy uh, was the Hannah, which came was owned by John Glover, General John Glover. And he's from Marblehead. And all the men on board the Hannah were Marbleheaders. Marblehead men. But Beverly is where the Hannah was fitted out to go on its first cruise. So Beverly claims to be the uh, home of the American Navy. But really, Washington's private Navy was not really the birth of the American Navy, I, I don't think. Uh, the actual birth of the American Cont Continental Navy was on October 13th of 1775, when the Continental Congress in Philadelphia passed the law to establish the Continental Navy. So some people claim that Philadelphia should be the birthplace of the American Navy. But then other people say, no, we had some earlier battles on Lake Champlain. Uh, you know, Whitehurst, uh, New York should be the birthplace of the American Navy. And then some people say Providence, Rhode Island should be the birthplace of the American Navy because of the Gaspé affair, Gaspé affair, which is a few years before the American Revolution started, was one of the first uh, sort of uh, offensives against uh, British shipping or British uh, power on the ocean. So a lot of people claim to be the birthplace of the American Navy. And I have a footnote in the book about that. And I basically say, because I'm sort of conciliatory and one of my degrees is in negotiation, I said, well, everybody should just be happy that they have a part of the story. And I don't think there's any clear cut uh, argument for one place claiming to be the birthplace of the American Navy. So everybody should be happy and not be so ridiculously American and demand to be the first because Americans are big on firsts. They have to be the first, they have to be the biggest, they have to be the best. Well, calm down a little bit and just be happy that you have a piece of the story. 
So how did privateers feel about attacking loyal loyalist ships? Or did they know there were loyalist ships? Did they fly a flag that said they were for the British? No, well, there were a number of loyalist ships because New York, as your listeners know, uh, New York after 1776 was basically in the hands of the British. And uh, New York had a lot of loyalists. A lot of loyalists fled from other colonies to New York. And there was a lot of money and, and anger in New York. So they got permission from Parliament and the King to launch privateers from New York. And they launched hundreds of them. And they captured a lot of American ships. But they were just treated by the Americans just like any British privateer. They didn't have a special loyalist flag. In fact, one of the difficulties at sea is determining who you're about to attack because some people use false flags to draw somebody in. And uh, what you essentially had to do is get close enough to call over with your speaking trumpet and uh, figure out who this person was and whether they were potentially a valid prize. And you knew that they were somebody who would attack if they started shooting at you. And sometimes you could tell just by the outfitting of the ship and using your spyglass by who was on board and their uniforms, whether it was a British or American ship. But the Americans treated New York privateers, which were loyalist privateers, the same as they treated the ones that came out of Liverpool and London. So there was no difference. If you were British, you were the enemy. Uh, do you, did you find any examples of maybe women that were either involved or privateer <laughs> captains or anything like that? I, I wish I did. No, there is a single story about a woman who was a privateersman during the American Revolution, but the book that mentions it is from the late 1800s, has no citations, and I tried to look very hard for any evidence of this being true, and I couldn't find it. Now, people love to have women on these ships. There were women there were women that fought in the American Revolution. There were women that were on American whaling ships. There were even two women that were pirates, Anne Bonnie and Mary Reed, but they weren't large numbers. And, uh, and privateering, I didn't come across a single instance of a woman who fought on board a privateering vessel. I do have some stories about women in, women in the book, uh, so, you know, like Abigail Adams, but, but one, one story is sort of a negative story. This one privateersman, he went off and when he came back from a successful cruise, he realized that his wife, while he was away, had been spending his money that he had earned from his earlier cruises with reckless abandon. So he took out an ad in a local newspaper saying, basically, she's on her own. I'm not paying any of her debts. Don't accept any of her bills anymore. And you know, <laughs> whether that marriage survived, I don't know. But it was, it was hilarious that he had to post an ad saying, basically, I'm not going to pay for the hole that my wife got me into while I was away fighting for my country. So in your book, you mentioned uh, Benedict Arnold. There were a couple ships named after him. As we all yes. know, he kind of defected to the British. Do those ship names change? No, well, the, the two Benedict Arnolds both had the end of their career before he became a traitor. They were in 1778, early 1777. And one of the Benedict Arnolds, uh, it was a tragic story. It uh, it basically crashed off Plymouth, Massachusetts, and more than 100 men on board froze to death. So that was the end of that Benedict Arnold. The other one um, was uh, more successful, but then it ended its career. And there were no more Benedict Arnolds after his traitorous action going over to the British. Benedict Arnold's a fascinating character. I mean, uh, he had some good beefs against the Americans. They treated him pretty horrifically. I still don't agree with his decision to defect, but you can understand that the more that you know about his history and how he was treated, uh, he had good reason to be angry with the Americans. So you had some really good stories about ships. Is there a favorite maybe ship name or captain or something like that that maybe you'd like to tell us about that was a privateer? <laughs> No, well, I already, I already told you about Harrod, and he's probably my favorite captain. There was a captain, uh, uh, Waters, Daniel Waters, uh, Newburyport privateer Thorn, that ha had a really cute, uh, he, he has a fairly small ship, lightly armed, and he attacked two loyalists or New York privateers that were much more powerful than he was, captured both of them, but one of them got in the way while he told them, stay there, I'm gonna come back for you. And obviously they didn't because he had to capture the other one which was trying to get away. But that battle was so impressive and 
scores of people died during that battle that John Adams actually wrote a letter to one of his counterparts in France, a French diplomat, and basically chastised him. This is in 1781, I think, uh, chastised him saying, you know, you and France don't ballyhoo a lot of our privateering battle successes enough. And here's this Daniel Waters, this Captain Waters who battled two huge privateers and had this you know, great success, even though he lost one of them. You need to write about it. And they did. The, the local editor of one of the ma major newspapers in France wrote a very glowing story about this American battle. And the reason John Adams felt that was so important is he thought that that would encourage the French to send out more privateers. Because once France joined America, uh, against the British, France started sending out their own privateering vessels. So John Adams, ever the thoughtful patriot, was trying to drum up more maritime support for the war effort. Okay, so for our last question, uh, I want to ask you a little bit about Washington's plantation almost burned in 1871. Can you tell us a little bit about that on how that might have been attacked and burned? Yes. Uh, now, now, you, now you just caught me on one of the, um, is it the Congress? I'm trying to, when you write a book, I've written a lot of books. There's a lot of facts in these books. I'm getting older. Facts go in and out of my brain. And even though I only wrote this book recently, there are a lot of stories in it. And I, I'm just blanking on the name of the British ship, but I can tell you the story. The British ship, what was it called? What was it called? Like, I'm just blanking on it. There's a British ship basically in, in late 17, uh, 1770s that was going up and down the Potomac River, burning American plantations, basically causing havoc. And they came to uh, Mount Vernon. And of course, the captain of the British ship knew who owned Mount Vernon. And uh, he was not going to burn it. He, he was not going to burn it. But Lund Washington, the cousin of George Washington, who had put in charge of Mount Vernon while George was off fighting, uh, tried to make nice with the British captain uh, because the British captain demanded some goods and, and supplies. And Lund Washington originally said, no, I'm not going to give you anything. I'm in charge of this plantation while George is away, General Washington. And he wouldn't want me to do that. But then the ship, the British ship came over. I think it was the Savage, if I remember that. Anyway, the British ship came over. The captain got off and said, uh, sent his men in and said, you know, really, I, I want this stuff. Lund Washington was brought to the ship. He brought aboard a chicken, some sheep, some other goods, basically offerings to the British captain, in effect, to thank him for not burning down Mount Vernon. At the same time, the British captain had sent ashore a proclamation saying that any British slaves, any American slaves who wanted to defect to the British side would be given their freedom. And that was being done all along the colonies. So a number of George Washington slaves bolted. Well, one Washington thought he had done a great thing by saving Mount Vernon from the torch. But when George Washington found out about it, he was mortified. He said, I, you know, I would have much rather had it been laid under the torch than be given special treatment. And for you to have treated these British brigands so well, he was embarrassed. And uh, Lafayette actually sent him a note saying, George, this is not going to look very good that you were spared. But it didn't cause any major problems. It might have caused a problem, a long term problem with George Washington's relationship with his cousin, Lund Washington. But uh, that just is an indication George was very much into appearances for good reason, and he wanted to always be seen doing the right thing. And he had told Lund Washington, you know, not to do anything in the favor of the British while he was away. So that's the story. But here you got an insight into what happens in a writer's mind. I wrote that story. It's a great part of the book. I love it. And I still can't remember the name of that British ship. Later on, George Washington got some satisfaction because that British ship went, went out into the ocean and it was attacked by an American ship and it was thoroughly uh, oh, wow. beaten up, really obliterated. Wait a second. I'm not going to let you get away with that. I'm I think gonna... somebody said it was the Savage, but... The, the Savage, yeah, I think the, yeah, the Savage was... 
Yeah, that must have been the British ship. Anyway. I don't know. <laughs> it's in here. Where is it? Oh, here it is. The Congress and the Savage. Yes. The HMS Savage. There it is. <laughs> so it's in the book. But now you guys should all give me the benefit of the doubt and realize that good authors are humble authors that admit they don't know everything, not even what's in their book. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much for taking time out, uh, Mr. Dolan, to talk about your wonderful book here. Here it is again, sure. Rebels at Sea. It's a wonderful book. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. And go to your local bookstore. The owl. What's it called? The owl. The learned owl. The learned, <laughs> learned owl. I like that. You know, Minerva's <laughs> owl. Wisdom comes late. But if you get this book, wisdom will come to you early. <laughs> That's right. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. I hope to come to Hudson someday. We hope to see you there. Yeah. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Good night. <laughs> okay. Bye bye.